Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured. But the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. At the very end of part two of his Prolegomena to Any Future Metaphysics, Immanuel Kant has an appendix to pure natural science, which is called of the system of the categories. And, you know, if you know much about Kant, even from sort of preliminary or summary work, you know that this notion of the categories is really one of uh, the, the keystones of his work. But it's not something radically new, at least in its terminology, because Aristotle had a very famous book called The Categories, and in it, Aristotle distinguished 10 different categories. This runs uh, throughout his works. You see these coming up in the Metaphysics, in the Nicomachean Ethics, and in other places as well. And so this is part of Aristotle's Metaphysics, and Kant thinks that that's where Aristotle and successors to Aristotle have actually gone wrong. Kant thinks that he is, for the first time, providing a genuine system of the categories. And so he begins this section by talking about something that I think we can generalize even further. He says, there can be nothing more desirable to a philosopher than to be able to derive the scattered multiplicity, a plurality of the concepts, right, or the principle, Grundsätze, which had occurred to him in concrete use from a principle a priori and to unite everything in this way in one cognition. Now, that's a very long, fancy way of saying what we want to do when we're in actually engaging in metaphysics or ontology or, you know, this sort of, uh, tr you know, let's call it categorical work, is to take everything and say, well, we've got something that connects these. They're not simply isolated or opposed principles or concepts. They actually all fit together in some sort of order. And he says that uh, he formally only believed that those things which remained after a certain abstraction and seem by comparison to constitute a particular kind of cognitions were completely collected. But this was just an aggregate. An aggregate is when you're taking a bunch of things and kind of heaping them up together, right? So they're not really all that systematically connected with each other. Instead, what is happening is you're just kind of throwing them all in a corner and saying, there you go. That's not yet a system uh, for Kant, he says. Now he knows that just so many, neither more nor less, this numbering is very important to him, can constitute this kind of cognition and perceives the necessity of his division. This constitutes comprehension. Fully understanding something, only now has he attained a system. So you don't want an aggregate, you want an actual system. And notice the ways that he talks about this, comprehending it, you know, grasping it as a totality, dividing things from each other, and not dividing them sort of willy-nilly, but along the reasonable lines, coming up with the right number, no more, no less, saying that you've actually worked it out fully. And he, he's got a really interesting analogy here that he's going to make to how it is that we research a language in, in a scientific way. And, and it's good to keep in mind that by this time, 
not only has grammar been around and taught for a very long time, it was part of the you know, trivium in the Middle Ages, but they're starting to formulate laws, regularities of languages themselves and to do comparative study of language, which is really going to take off much more in the following century, but it's already got its beginnings there. So Kant says, to search in our ordinary knowledge for the concepts which do not rest on particular experience and yet occur in all knowledge from experience. Okay, that's what Kant has been working on. Um, presupposes neither greater reflection nor deeper insight than to detect in a language the rules of the actual use of words generally and thus to collect elements for a grammar. This is an activity that was going on at the time. Uh, people would go to, you know, uh, far off places, meet with people whose language they didn't understand, start to learn that language, try to figure out how does this language actually work? And then they would write grammars of it. Missionaries, for example, did that with Native American tribes that they encountered. So he says, in fact, both of these inquiries are very closely related. Now, isn't that an interesting idea? It's not just an analogy. He's saying that there's a kind of connection between linguistic work and let's call it metaphysical work. So he goes on and he says, what's, what's the similarity? Even though we're not able to give a reason why each language has just this and no other formal constitution, and still less why exactly so many, neither more nor less, of such formal determinations in general can be found in it. Well, it's the same with the categories of the understanding. There's the amount that you've got, and, you know, we can't actually provide an ultimate explanation for why exactly these, but we can say, here they are, right? So Kant goes on and he says, all right, what about Aristotle? And he's going to call Aristotle's work a rhapsody at several different points. And this is actually a derogatory term in this case, right? The rhapsodes are people who are divinely inspired by the gods to either write poetry or interpret poetry. They don't really know what they're doing. This goes all the way back to uh, Plato's dialogue, The Ion. Kant has this in mind. He's like saying, you know, Aristotle's a smart guy, but he really didn't know what he was doing when he came up with these categories, nor are the people following him, trying to make these categories work, really knowing what they're engaged with. So he says, Aristotle collected 10 pure elementary concepts under the name of categories, right? And uh, here we've got a slightly different organization than how it's typically laid out in Aristotle's book. So what are they? Um, well, substance, what, what it is that, you know, is the subject, uh, not not uh, in something else. Other things are predicated of it. Stays the same over time. Quantity, how much? Quality, what kind, right? Rel relatives, uh, pros t in relation to. Place, time, uh, you can say space if you want to as well. Um, literally asking where, when, position, how things are laid out. Uh, having, like, you know, wearing a, a tie, action and passion. And then in the, the uh, footnote here, we have in Latin, substantia, qualitas, quantitas, relatio, actio, passio. So action and passion are being moved in. Quando ubi situs habitus, right? Uh, so so uh, when we see him re referring to the seventh and eighth and ninth, what we're talking about there is place, time, and position, spatial, temporal uh, qualifiers, we could say. So he says, uh, to these, which were also called predicaments, he found himself obliged to add five post-predicaments, some of which are uh, contained in the former, but this rhapsody, so you see that term must be considered and commended as a mere hint for future inquirers, not as a regularly worked out idea, and so it has been in the present more advanced state of philosophy, rejected is quite useless. Well, rejected by some, still used by others, 
And Kant is going to be uh, one of the rejectors because he says it's not systematic. Um, and he says, after long reflection on the pure elements of human knowledge, I succeeded in distinguishing with certainty and in separating the pure elementary concepts of sensibility, space and time, from those of the understanding. So really important initial division there that we saw carried out earlier in the prolegomena. Thus, the seventh, eighth, and ninth categories had to be excluded from the old list. The others, he said, were of no service to me because there was no principle on which the understanding could be fully mapped out and all the functions determined exhaustively and with precision. You could ask Aristotle, where did you come up with this list? Why these? What's the connection here? And Aristotle might say, well, you know, substance is primary. All these other things, these other nine are predicated of substance. And then somebody like Kant could come along and go, well, that's fine, but that doesn't really tell you why quantity quality relations should be different from each other. Why did you come up with this list? And what about these weird ones like action and passion seem to be kind of correlatives or having, you know, why, why isn't that included under something like quality, right? And Aristotle doesn't really have answers to provide. So this does seem to be a, a serious criticism. So Kant says, okay, how do we proceed then? What's, what's my approach? Well, let's focus on an act of the understanding, a kind of acts in general that we can then abstract about. An act of the understanding, verstand is handlung, something that the understanding does, not just a single action, but something that it does over and over and over again. Um, well, what is that? Judging, judgment, urteil, right? The uh, connecting things together in certain ways, saying this is this, or this has this quality, or this has this modality, or what, you know, this, this quantity, or whatever we're going to say. So he goes on and he says that, um, I found this act of the understanding consists in judging here, the labors of the logicians were ready to, at hand, though not entirely free from defects. And with his help, I was enabled to exhibit, to put out there, uh, a complete table of the pure functions. And there he uses the word, uh, you know, verstand is function, uh, functions of the understanding. What it is that the understanding does in engaging in these judgments. So and he says, these were undetermined in regard to any object, so they can be applied to any of them. And he says, I finally referred these functions of judging to objects in general, or rather to the condition of determining judgments as objectively valid. So they can be used for empirical matters, singulars, particulars, but they can be used across the board for anything that we can apply them to. And so he says, though, so there arose the pure concepts of the understanding concerning which I could make certain that these and this exact number only notice again, the insistence on we've got the right amount of these uh, categories or concepts constitute our whole cognition of things from pure understanding. Then he says, I was justified in calling them categories, the old name because that's what they're actually doing. And he said, I reserved for myself the liberty of adding under the title of predicables, all the concepts deducible from them by combinations, whether among themselves or with the pure form of the appearance, that is space or time, or with its matter. Uh, as soon as a system of transcendental philosophy should be completed, the construction of which I was engaged in the critique of pure reason. So he's saying, I, I already did this in the critique of pure reason. And now here he says, the essential point in this, my system of categories, which distinguishes it from the old rhapsody, the Aristotelian category, which proceeded without any principle, is this. By means of it, the true meaning of the pure concepts of the understanding and the condition of their use could be exactly 
determined. They are themselves nothing but logical functions and do not constitute the least concept of an object in itself. No noumena, no ding in zik, right? But requires some sensuous intuition as a basis. So this means, as he's going to say, you can only apply these categories of the understanding to our experiential uh, engagement with a spatio-temporal world, right? Uh, in which we, we exist and have perceptions, but also apply our understanding as well. So you can't apply this as others are doing. Uh, as he's going to say, if you think about previous metaphysics, whether Aristotle's or that of others, they're mixing up two kinds of concepts. They're mixing up the things that are phenomenal and we you know, make judgments of experience by means of bringing in the pure concepts of the understanding, which we've seen are derived in this way. There, there's that, and then there's things that go beyond that. They are transcendental, right, or transcendent, and they have to do with, as Kant is going to call it, um, matters of pure reason or reflection. Um, a little bit later on, he'll say that uh, these are foreign concepts which might otherwise intrude among the pure concepts of the understanding. Um, and he says we can organize them too. We can organize them into tables, but we have to take our cue from the categories, the concepts of the understanding, not just jump into this other world. And we better not mix all these things up together and say we're doing metaphysics, because if we do, we're being unsystematic and we're going beyond the bounds of possible experience. And we're going to get ourselves into all sorts of, as he's going to call it, confusion, right? My systematic division saves us from confusion, he says. And he tells us that the concepts of reason are of quite another nature and origin. So they can have a table, they can have an organization, they can have a system, but it's going to be as he says, uh, quite another form from that of the concepts of the understanding. This so necessary separation, he goes on, has never yet been made in any system of metaphysics, where as a rule, these ideas of reason are all mixed up with the concepts of the understanding, like children belonging to one family. A confusion, this is where he concludes this, that was unavoidable in the absence of a definite system of categories. So Kant's system of categories is really doing three things. One is it's replacing the totally inadequate Aristotelian rhapsody of the 10 categories and you know five other things mixed into that work. Eh, we're getting rid of that. It's also providing us with the comprehensive system, according to Kant, for the understanding and it's helping us to draw a neat dividing line between the categories and concepts of the understanding and those of a different faculty, that of pure reason, which we don't want to blend in there and thereby you know, get everything confused. So having a system of the categories turns out to be very, very important from Kant's perspective.